Um, tonight's speaker is Jeff Deems. He is a uh, research scientist at CU Boulder, and uh, he works with the NOAA Western Water Assessment and the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And um, his love of skiing has inspired him to study snow as a career using lasers. <laughs> so if I'm not mistaken, he's going to tell us tonight um, about his work laser mapping the snowpack in the Highland Bowl and finding um, the last untracked bits of powder on a powder day. <laughs> anyway, um, I hope everyone enjoys tonight's talk, and I'll give it over to Jeff. Great. Thanks. I got it. Thanks, Matt. Uh, the Highland Bowl technology is, is uh, still proprietary. <laughs> Um, but if you see me up there, maybe follow where I'm going. Um, uh, yeah, tonight I'm going to uh, show you guys some pretty cool new research that we're doing um, using lasers to map snow. Um, it's pretty gee whiz, uh, fancy technology, and I think it's, it's one of the more exciting things to happen in the field of snow hydrology uh, in a long time. Uh, I should point out, we've got a whole host of collaborators on this. Um, the program I'm going to spend most of the time talking about is, is run out of the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, my colleague Tom Painter is the, the principal investigator there. Uh, but a whole host of collaborators, including hydrologic interests in California and Colorado, uh, as well as researchers uh, at the University of Colorado uh, and at the U.S. Army Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab. Uh, so uh, don't let me try to insinuate that this is all my work. There's a whole bunch of people involved. Um, so yeah, laser mapping of mountain snowpacks. I'll start off with the punchline. This map of snow water content in the Tuolumne River uh, of California from uh, April 21st, um, 2013, this past year, is the first map of its kind, measured snow water content for an entire river basin in the western U.S. Uh, the Tuolumne River is in the northern half of uh, Yosemite National Park, and it feeds Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, which is the water supply and hydropower supply for the city of San Francisco. It's, an, it's a critically important water resource, and we're taking steps using our new technology uh, to enable better and more efficient management of that resource. I'll come back to this later. I'll show you how we made this map. Um, but first, I'm going to get into why we need to make a map like this, why we need to apply a new technology um, to map snow rather than, than stick with the status quo. Uh, I'll give you an overview of how we measure, monitor, uh, and simulate or model snowpacks, what the science tells us we should be doing, uh, talk a little bit about how we map things, including snow, with lasers, uh, and then show you some results from uh, the inaugural year of the JPL Airborne Snow Observatory. We also were integrated tightly with water management uh, at Hetch Hetchy, uh, so I'll show you some results there. And then I'll finish up with some other cool laser stuff we're doing with snow as well that's, that's of different projects. So as many of you are probably aware, snow is our water supply in the western U.S. 75 to 80 percent of the western U.S. water comes from snowmelt. Knowing uh, how much is up there and when it's going to come out uh, is a big deal, and we spend a lot of resources trying to ascertain that. In recent years, we've seen uh, increasing stresses on the water supply uh, in the western U.S. due to uh, many factors, including uh, changing climate and a growing population. Here's Lake Mead in 2009. Um, you can see the bathtub ring. That's how full it used to be. This graph, uh, the blue line is water supply. The red line is water use. And the fact that they intersect should be troubling uh, uh, to anybody who lives uh, in, in the region occupied and fed by the Colorado River. When did they, what year did they intersect? 2008-ish, 5-ish. These are 10-year running averages. so. Uh, any individual year jumps up and down quite a bit more. Um, water demand's only projected to increase. Uh, supply is pretty uncertain, you can tell by the 
the wide blue zone there that projected into the future. We're not quite sure which way that's going to go. If we move upstream a little bit, look at Lake Powell. Uh, the image on the left is a, is a satellite photo of Lake Powell in March of 1999. Uh, and on the right is January last year. And you can see that there's quite a bit less surface area to Lake Powell last year. Uh, and the graph on the bottom is showing uh, uh, inflow uh, in the, the brown spikes on the bottom. That's the annual inflow from 1980 to current. Uh, and then the storage, the total amount of water in Lake Powell. Uh, and back in the early 2000s, we hit the lowest elevation uh, since Lake Powell was filled. We recovered a bit since then, but we're sort of on another downward slope here. Uh, and given the past two drought years that we've had here in the Colorado Rockies, that's not too surprising. So water supply is a big deal. If we move up in, a little bit up in the watershed, all the way up in the watershed to the, the top of the Colorado uh, in uh, Dillon, Colorado, 2011, uh, we saw that peak flows uh, into Lake Dillon exceeded the forecast. Uh, by quite a bit, and that's shown in the, in the two graphs on the right where black, the black line is the actual flow and the red line was, is a, a range of, of forecasts. And late in the, the snowmelt season, in late June, early July, we see that the, uh, the amount of water that came into Lake Dillon was quite a bit more than was forecast. That required Denver Water to open the floodgates as far as they could without flooding the outlet stores down, downstream. Um, and it was touch and go for a while because they weren't sure exactly how much water was going to come down. They came to us later and said, okay, what happened here? Uh, was this dust on snow? Was this the, the, uh, excuse me, the pine beetle impact changing the forest cover? Was this just a weird snow pattern? Um, the answer, as far as we can tell, is yes. It was all of these things. Um, <laughs> But it speaks to the challenge of managing water with a resource upstream that you're not quite sure how much is there. Uh, and we only have limited observation capabilities to, to tell us how much is up there. And last year in the Tuolumne River, uh, California was facing uh, a record drought. Uh, it's looking worse this year. Um, but in the top left there is uh, looking down on Tuolumne Meadows, the first of May. The meadows are already melting out, and you can see that the snow line is pretty high up there. Uh, we drove to the top of Tioga Pass in March uh, to do field work, and it was open to the public to drive across the range in early May, uh, which, is, which is really early. Um, the water managers in Hetch Hetchy and in other basins uh, in the Sierra Nevada were pretty concerned about meeting demand last year, uh, and it turned out to be a pretty good year for us to demonstrate uh, this new technology and the, and the value of mapping uh, the snowpack over an entire river basin. So, before I can tell you about all the new cool stuff, we have to figure out, or I have to show you what, uh, what we do currently, how we measure and how we uh, monitor snowpacks, um, and then forecast runoff uh, in, in the western U.S. The technology goes back quite a ways. Dr. James Church um, was a, actually a literature professor um, in uh, University of, <coughs> of Nevada in Reno. Uh, in 1909, he developed this snow coring tube where he could measure the amount of water that was that stored at a, in the snowpack, uh, and then uh, developed a, a series of measurement locations known as a snow course, where he related the amount of snow that was in the mountains on April 1st to water that flowed into Lake Tahoe, or actually the, the level of Lake Tahoe, uh, later in the summer. Um, and he, his original snow course was on Mount Rose, Nevada, above Lake Tahoe. And that location is still measured today. It provides the longest continuous snow record uh, that we have in the western US. And that's the, that's the trace of the April 1st snow water content at Mount Rose from 1910 to current. Um, that's a pretty cool data set. And his legacy is continued today. We use the same technology uh, to manually measure snow. Uh, so in the top right, Frank Gerke there from California Depart Department of Water Resources is, is plunging the coring tube into the snowpack, which is then pulled out and weighed. And that tells you the amount of water that's there stored as snow uh, at that site. So there's a network of snow courses around 
uh, the western U.S. And there's also a network of automated sna stations called SNOWTEL sites. Uh, SNOWTEL stands for Snow Telemetry, so these are <coughs> automatic sites that, that telemeter their data uh, uh, to a, a central location, and, and it's available in near real time. And one of those is shown there on the bottom right. And the primary instrument there is this basically a pillow or a bag filled with antifreeze on the ground. And snow falls on top of that and builds up, and that weighs the snowpack and tells you how much, uh, how much water is sitting there. So the, the yellow dots in the map on the left here show snow tell sites throughout the western U.S. And it, it's quite a network. It's, it's extensive, uh, over 800 sites. Uh, and these provide us with real-time data uh, on an hourly basis throughout the winter. Um, so what we're, the parameter of most interest here is the water equivalence of the snow. If you took uh, a unit area of the snowpack and melt it down, how much water is that? And we refer to that as snow water equivalent or SWE. Uh, and that's really the holy grail here. We want to know how much SWE is in the mountains. Here is a uh, satellite photo or satellite product of the Elk Mountains um, Roaring Fork, pretty much dead center there. This is in 2002, uh, 3rd of April. The blue areas show um, uh, snow-covered area, and, and anything that's not blue is not snow. Um, you can see there's some pale blue dots sticking around there, and those are snow tail and snow course sites uh, in the region here. So if we go back one, that spatially extensive network of yellow dots on the left, when you zoom in, starts to look a lot more sparse. And in a basin the size of the Roaring Fork, uh, we're actually fairly flush with observation sites compared to other basins throughout the West, um, but there's still uh, only a few there. Now notice how many of those are close to the edge of the blue shaded area. That means they are in the process of or will very, sh very shortly melt out and not be delivering snowpack data anymore. But you can tell that there's a whole bunch of snow area above those snow tail sites at higher elevations. Once the snow tells and the snow courses start melting out, we're effectively flying blind as far as water management. We don't know how much snow is left up in the mountains. This is another way to look at that at, in all the western states. The lines top and bottom here are the maximum and minimum terrain elevations in those states. Uh, and then the, the box represents, the box and dots represent the, uh, the range of snow tail site elevations in each state. So Colorado's the third one in from the left. Uh, and you can see there's quite a bit of terrain above and below uh, the snow tail site network. So if we have uh, a lot of snow at low elevations, like we have this year, uh, or late in the season once all the snow tail sites have melted out, there's still plenty of snow above that network. Um, so really, we're missing a large portion of the picture there in terms of the complete cover. Here's another way to think of it. Here's the snow stake cam at Steamboat last week. Um, and these are starting to pop up in a lot of ski areas. I guess ground truth is um, being enabled by the internet. Um, so to their credit, they reported 10 inches, not 12, uh, even though that little <laughs> finger of snow <laughs> sticks up uh, to 12 inches. Um, but those of you who are skiers know that when the ski report says 10 inches, sure, plenty, plenty of places on the mountain are going to have 10 inches of snow. There's going to be plenty of places that have less than that and plenty that have quite a bit more than that. So really, the snow stake is just an index of how much snow is on the mountain. And if you ski at a place a lot, you know, you know what two inches means, you know what 10 inches means, you know what two feet means as far as how much snow is elsewhere on the mountain. And you go find your powder stash. Um, and you avoid certain runs that you know get wind scoured. The same principle applies here. We have snow tail sites, which are effectively snow stakes. And we have a river basin that surrounds those. And the snow that accumulates in different portions of that river basin are related to how much snow is on the snow tail site, but it's not the same everywhere. What that means is we have to use those sites in an index method. And an index method means you use, um, we use the snow tail um, uh, and snow course information on a certain date, in this case January 1st, in a statistical relationship with how much stream flow usually ends up in the river later in the spring and summer uh, when we have that amount of snow. So here's the current forecast. Um, there should be a February 1st one coming out any day now. I kept refreshing my browser today to come up with the latest map and it's not up yet. Uh, so here's January 1st forecast from uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. 
which runs the Snowtail network. And you can see the green dots in Colorado. You know, they're saying we're pretty much 100% of average in terms of forecast flows for the summer. Not looking so great in uh, California, Nevada, and in the Northwest. The lack of dots in California is because California runs its own network. Uh, and NRCS only has a couple areas around Lake Tahoe there. Um, uh, so I didn't go to the trouble to put that map together for you all. But you get the point. So we're forecasting based on the amount of snow on the ground right now for summer, uh, spring and summer flows a couple months out. Uh, the graph on the right shows a cumulative error at, in the American River in California. And the take home here is that half the time, forecast errors from forecasts of this type are on the order of 20%. And 20% of the time, one in five years, the forecast error is greater than 40%. So that's almost half, one in five years. That's, that's a pretty big range of uncertainty uh, to have in a forecast. And a large part of that is due to this, this index method. So the way the index method works is it relies on a period of record. We have to, we're relating the current conditions to what we've seen in the past. And if the current water year, the current snowpack, is a lot like what we've seen in the past years, then this method's going to work actually really well. But if it's not like it, and by not like it, I mean maybe, maybe the Snowtail site says exactly the same thing as it did 20 years ago, but the pattern of snow that accumulated in the mountains is different, or it's a warmer temperature, or there's dust on the snowpack and it's going to melt out a lot faster and evaporate more. Uh, in that case, the current year is not like the past, and the past, therefore, is not much of a guide for us. And in those kind of situations, this index method is going to struggle. We also use an index method in short-term forecasts. So the, the, when we look at January first snowpack and relate it to the summer, that's a long-term or a medium-term forecast. Short-term is on the order of days. What's going to happen over the next week? And for that, we use air temperature. Air temperature is really easy to measure. It's measured in lots of places. Um, and the way the, these, these snowmelt models work, these computer models, is they take air temperature as an input and forecast air temperature. Uh, and then they model or simulate how the snowpack will respond to that. Uh, and then, and then uh, provide a, a stream flow. If you have a really warm, uh, uh, warm spring, we'll get most of the melt coming earlier. Uh, cold and snowy spring, most of that melt will come in the summer. Kind of makes sense. The actual reason this works is because air temperature is well correlated with solar radiation. When it's sunny, it gets warmer. This is not breaking news to you guys, but it turns out that, sun that sunlight is the major snow melter, not air temperature. So, and, and the graph here on the left is uh, incoming solar versus air temperature, and you can see there's a general relationship there, but there's also quite a bit of scatter. Um, if you think about, uh, well, heck, we drove here from Boulder uh, yesterday, and it was seven degrees when we left Boulder, and it was 18 degrees in Carbondale. Uh, and we were on dry roads the whole way. And it had been snowing continuously for several days. Now, clearly, the air temperature didn't melt snow on the roads. Sure, the salt and sand helped, but it was because the sand was there to absorb more sunlight, and the snow was melted by sunlight, uh, that those roads were, were dry. Um, the same thing happens uh, in the springtime. It can be quite warm outside, 50, 60 degrees, and you still have snow lingering in the shade. Um, that's because there's no sun hitting it. The same concept applies with these air temperature-based forecasts as with the snow pillow-based forecast. That is, if we get conditions, snow melt conditions, that are different from how the model was trained, then the snow is going to melt off incorrectly in the model. The, the charts on the right show uh, stream flow simulated and observed uh, in uh, the San Juan Basin for 2000 on the bottom all the way up through 2010. And the shaded areas, blue and red, uh, represent where there was either an under forecast, so there was too much early melt, or there was more observed early melt than forecast in the red, um, or uh, an over forecast where uh, the, uh, the observations were less than were forecast. And you can see there's three years that stick out to me in this, uh, 2003, 9, and 10, where there's a big red splotch 
uh, in the early snowmelt season. And those happen to be extra dusty years. You get a lot of dust on the snowpack. And dust works to absorb extra solar energy and melt the snowpack off much faster. So if we have more dust or we're absorbing more solar radiation than the model thinks is going on, then we're going to melt the snowpack off sooner uh, than the forecast model says. So there's lots of situations that can give an index type model uh, lots of trouble. So what does the science tell us about this? So I've, I've already indicated that solar radiation is uh, the primary melt driver. So if we look at the full energy balance, and these are all of the inputs and outputs of energy that's available for the snowpack to warm up and melt. Solar radiation is the big one. Um, and the graph on the right shows, uh, this is observed data from uh, the San Juan Mountains in southwest Colorado. Uh, this is May 21st through 25th uh, in 2005, I believe. And these were warm days. Uh, 13 to 15 C is mid-50s Fahrenheit at 12,000 feet. So pretty warm days. The black line, the heavy black line that goes up and down each day is the total energy input to the snowpack. Very closely following it is a thin red line, and that's solar radiation, net solar radiation. That's how much sunlight is absorbed. There's a blue line down quite a bit further, and that's the contribution of air temperature. So it's solar radiation that's driving the snow melt here. To get at that and get, about, get at how, how much sunlight is being absorbed, we, we need to know the reflectivity of the snowpack, or the albedo. And albedo is affected just by natural snow processes, uh, corn snow absorbs more sunlight than cold, dry powder snow. And that's just from the, uh, we get bigger snow grains growing in the springtime than we do in the winter. But also, like in the background photograph, uh, impurities such as dust, um, uh, tree litter, uh, or industrial pollutants like black carbon also darken the snowpack and absorb more solar energy changing, again, changing the energy balance, changing the relationship uh, between air temperature and the snow melt uh, that, the, that the operational models depend on. And back to the distribution of snow in the river basin. Where the snow ends up in the basin varies year to year, depending on storm track, depending on intensity of storms. Um, and that distribution controls when and how fast uh, the snow melts out. Uh, so you can end up with vastly different spatial patterns of snow in a river basin, even if you may have the same value on your snowtail site that exists somewhere in that basin. And the snowpack's going to melt out uh, much differently in two different cases there. So what we need there are explicit maps of how much snow or SWE uh, is in the, in the mountain basin across, uh, across its full extent rather than just at single points. I'm going to show you a movie. And this is a, this is a time lapse movie of snow melt uh, at our research basin down in the San Juans. And it just shows or serves to highlight that there's quite a bit of variability in where the snow ends up. This is just one melt season. Uh, so there was a particular storm track or a particular sequence of storms that fed uh, the snowpack here this year. Uh, and then there's a wind patterns that move it around and there's avalanches that, that uh, make it pile up at the base of steep slopes. Some of those patterns are going to persist year to year. You know, avalanches tend to happen on similar slopes. Um, so some of these deep piles that persist late into summer, those, those are going to be fairly consistent year to year. Other patterns are going to change pretty substantially depending on where the wind's blowing, how hard it's blowing, how wet the snow was when it fell all kinds of um, different factors. So our job is to try to figure out just how important that spatial pattern is uh, and what we can do with it. So I know you've all been thinking, why don't you just use lasers? Because that's the answer for everything. <laughs> Turns out that's true. There, that is a good solution here. Um, so the way forward that we've been pursuing is to use uh, some new tools, including lasers, to map uh, the snow distribution or snow depth and the reflectivity or albedo throughout the entire 
mountain basin, river basin, uh, instead of relying on a single or a couple of index sites. So how do we map surface elevations with lasers? A laser system uh, is usually referred to as a LIDAR system that's similar to laser radar. Um, and it's, it works the same as radar. It emits a pulse of energy, in this case light energy. It bounces off a target and comes back to a detector and we time how long that takes. It doesn't take very long. Um, and you do this a whole bunch of times a second with a scanning system and all of a sudden you've got a whole bunch of range to targets all over, all over your watershed. Those combined with GPS uh, and an inertial measurement unit that tells you not only where the aircraft is, but which way it will hit you, uh, allow you to precisely geolocate each of those laser shots in space, which produces a very high resolution, I'm talking on the order of a meter uh, spacing on the ground, map of surface elevations. So we do that in the summer when there's no snow, and we come back and do that again in the winter when there is snow, and we subtract those two elevation maps, and we get a map of snow depth. Another cool thing about lasers is they can see through trees. Uh, different bits of each laser pulse are reflected by multiple targets in its path as that, that beam diverges a little bit away from the laser source. That is represented by the center figure there. So if you stand in a forest at midday and you look up at the sky, even a really dense forest, you're going to see quite a bit of sunlight filtering through. And that's the same, we exploit that same pattern with the lasers. They, Bits of, the, uh, bits of the laser energy are reflected by the top of the tree and more bits of it are reflected by parts of the tree and then we get a ping off the ground. So we can map snowpacks under the forest canopy, uh, which is a critical distinction. Uh, I'm going to show you mostly airborne data, but we also have uh, tripod or ground-based systems uh, and I'll show you some, some data from uh, some of those at the end. Uh, so we subtract those, those uh, elevation maps uh, to, get, to get snow depth, um, and then we apply a modeled snow density. And snow depth varies quite strongly across the landscape. Uh, in this 250 meter square in the lower right, uh, this is up on Buffalo Pass north of Steamboat, uh, you can see quite a lot of variation in snow depth from zero to five meters just in that little patch. Uh, most of that has to do with with wind interaction around trees and making big drifts and dunes around the trees. Um, for reference, there's some yellow dots in that, photo, in that uh, image, and those are locations of manual snow depth measurements. So people running around with a big ruler stabbing it into the snow and reading how deep the snow is there. Um, those points represent one of the most intensive manual surveys ever conducted for snowpacks, and you can see it doesn't even barely compare uh, to the amount of data we can get uh, with the airborne laser system. We can also get uh, at the albedo, or we can measure the albedo or reflectivity of the snowpack using a hyperspectral camera. A hyperspectral camera is similar to your normal, say, point-and-shoot camera that sees in red, green, and blue, but it sees out into the infrared. Uh, and the, the graph here shows uh, snow reflectivity from the visible on the left, There's the narrow band on the left is visible, out into the near infrared. And you can see that as we get out into longer wavelengths, snow gets darker and darker. Uh, in fact, it's nearly black at 1.5 microns. It's kind of interesting to think about. Um, but the high values on the blue line here in the visible means that snow reflects nearly all uh, of visible light, which is why it looks white to our eyes. The red line shows dirty snow, really dusty snow, like you see in the background image, uh, and that's reflecting only about half of the visible light. In fact, we've measured uh, albedos down around 0.3 or even 0.27, uh, which is more like dirt than snow. Um, in fact, if you look that value up in a textbook, it'll tell you it is dirt, not snow. Um, so this has a tremendous impact on how much solar energy is being absorbed. Knowing how well, how, how that's distributed across the landscape, you can see quite a bit of variation uh, in the background photograph there from some near, nearly purely white areas that are fresh snowfall uh, to some really dark, uh, dark brown areas. Knowing that variation across the landscape allows us to, to uh, simulate how much 
sunlight is being absorbed and therefore is going to melt the snowpack. Those two systems, a scanning LIDAR system and a hyperspectral camera, are the core of the Airborne Snow Observatory that we've been flying uh, in two demonstration basins this year. Um, we've been flying on this Twin Otter aircraft, which is, uh, flies fairly low and slow, but they're, they're quite sturdy, one of the best bush planes in the world. Uh, we flew two river basins this year. Uh, the Tuolumne, which I showed you a picture of earlier, um, above Hetch Hetchy uh, in northern Yosemite Park, and also the Uncompagre above Ridgeway Reservoir, draining the north slope of the San Juan Mountains here in Colorado. Uh, we flew the snow-free uh, terrain in August of 2012 uh, for our reference data set, and then we flew snow-covered throughout the spring of 2013. Uh, we flew weekly or nominally weekly in the Tuolumne River, and we got uh, monthly flights in the Uncompagre. So here's a map of snow depth on April 21st in the Tuolumne. And yeah, you see some variability there, um, but this is really an unprecedented map. Let's zoom in a little bit uh, and see some of this variability. Um, for reference, uh, Tioga Pass is uh, down on the lower right. Uh, Lyell Mountain, uh, is, or Mount Lyell is the high point of the basin down at the very bottom, um, and Hetch Hetchy Reservoir is, is on the very left. And if we keep zooming in, you can see that there's a tremendous amount of variability in snow depth. You can see some lakes there that are consistent colors, uh, snow-covered, ice, ice, frozen snow-covered lakes. Uh, and then lots of different striping representing both uh, forest patterns as well as uh, wind drifting on uh, ridges and sub-ridges uh, in, this, in this rugged topography. Pretty exciting data. If we zoom in on Mount Lyell, um, this is the 3D terrain colored by uh, the, the red, green, and blue channels from the spectrometer, which is basically a true color image. Um, and it may be kind of tough to see with the light there, but there's some kind of dusty looking snow down here. Pay attention to that. Um, because the albedo that we measured was strongly dependent on that, how much dust was there. You see some very bright snow in the top upper reaches of the basin, uh, and then down to around 0.5 or, or uh, half the amount of sunlight being reflected uh, down in the lower reaches. And again, this is, this is mid-May last year. Here's a snow depth map of the same terrain. We can see some really, I'd call it extreme spatial variation in the amount of snow. Um, Again, this is a pretty dry year. If we threw several meters more snow on this landscape, like we usually have in the Sierras, uh, this pattern might be quite a bit smoother. Uh, and that would not only have more water in general, but would melt out uh, in a different fashion. So like I said, we flew weekly. Here's a time series of snow depth. Uh, and then to those snow depth maps, we apply a modeled snow density. And we model this based on, uh, we, we actually measure it using manual measurements. We use data from the snow tell uh, sites, the snow pillow sites. Uh, and then we use, uh, feed those observations into a computer model that simulates the densification of the snowpack. And uh, these models do pretty well. They do much better at simulating density than they do at simulating snow depth. Um, so if we can measure the snow depth, then we're 80% we're of the way there. Applying, uh, applying the density to the snow depth map gives us what we're looking for, the spatial map of snow water equivalent uh, throughout the mountain basin, uh, in this case, the Tuolumne. I'll step through our time series here, and you can watch the snowpack melt out through the spring of 2013. We'll start with April 2nd, 10th, 29th, 3rd, 11th of May, 20th, June 1st, and June 8th. Let's do that again. <coughs> Pretty cool, I think. Um, Everyone we show this to says the same thing. Oh my gosh, uh, can we have these data? Um, 
one of the, the head of the California Department of Water Resources snow survey team is on our, uh, on the ASO team. Um, and he routinely says, this is the future of snow measurement. We're not relying on, on index methods anymore when we have this type of technology. So we have our time series of SWE. The next natural question, you know, there's all kinds of science questions we can, we can address with, with this incredible uh, data set. Um, the next question is, well, how useful is this for water management? To get to there, we, uh, a big component, really the third component of the uh, Airborne Snow Observatory, we've got the LIDAR, we've got the spectrometer, and we've got the computing system that can turn around data products for water managers in 24 hours. We don't have to wait till the end of the season and then go back and see what we could have known. We can actually deliver data products uh, to the people who need them on a time frame um, that is relevant. Uh, so we give them maps of snow depth, water equivalent, uh, and albedo. Um, and then we can customize uh, those products for uh, whichever model is needed. I won't go into the horrendogram over there. That's just, just to impress you. So uh, because we were modeling, or sorry, we, because we were flying the entire basin above Hetch Hetchy, we worked closely with, um, with the Hetch Hetchy management, the folks that run O'Shaughnessy Dam, uh, which again is the water supply and hydropower supply for city of San Francisco. They, have, they are faced with, with a stark challenge, and that is through the snowmelt season, they get snowmelt flowing into the reservoir and meanwhile have to meter out stream flow for uh, the river ecology downstream and, and maintaining in stream flows. They have to generate power, which is free power for San Francisco. If they don't generate power, they have to buy it on the open market, which is really expensive. And they also have to provide water supply uh, for the citizens of uh, one of the US's major cities. Knowing ahead of time what this snow melt curve is gonna look like uh, is a big deal because it allows them to gauge how much and how fast they can fill their reservoir without spilling a bunch and losing the hydropower generation or without ending up with it too low and not having enough water uh, for the city. So we aggregated uh, the uh, Airborne Snow Observatory water equivalent and snow albedo products to uh, the model, uh, the simulation system that the Hetch Hetchy operation uses and they use all of these different little um, model elements and simulate the, the full energy balance and water balance of the snowpack over, those, uh, over each of those domains. And here's what we were looking at. It actually, this was supposed to be a demonstration mission last year. It was supposed to be, we collect data in parallel, uh, they do their normal operation, and we sort of like compare things as we go along. And, and then later on we can say, okay, um, what would we have done if we had these data? Well, last year turned out to be pretty dire snowpack-wise uh, in, in California. And we got to June 1st, and all of the snow pillows had melted out, and the Hetch Hetchy operators uh, were starting to freak out. They didn't know. Uh, they could easily blow it, basically, and end up with either spilling too much water uh, and costing a lot of money or not ending up with enough water uh, for the city. The graph shows uh, the simulated, uh, this is the raw output from their, their model simulation, and this is how much water is flowing into the reservoir. Uh, over time, this is, let's see, um, May 15th is the start of the graph, and uh, June 16th is the end. The dashed line uh, is the observed inflow. This is measured how much water is flowing into the reservoir. See the vertical bar there, that's June 1st. Uh, that's when they updated their model forecast and decided to include uh, the Airborne Snow Observatory data uh, in real time. And you could see up until that point, things were going pretty well. Their simulation wasn't too far, uh, too far off of, of the observed inflows. But they ran out of data from the snow pillows. They said, okay, we'll include ASO data and rerun the model. And it came out pretty different, uh, quite a bit less. Um, and when all was said and done, the observed inflows we're pretty close to that reforecast. Um, the observed inflow ended up being 28,000 acre feet less than the initial prediction. That's a ton of water. Um, and 
based on the revised forecast with the spatially distributed products we, we were able to provide, they ended up with a perfect operation. Full pool at the end of snow melt with no water lost uh, uh, over the spillway. And what they would have had to have done with their original forecast was keep the reservoir artificially low in order to absorb all of the water they thought was coming in. Uh, and they would have ended up with quite a bit less water in the reservoir than they did. Knowing even after all of their snow pillow sites had mount, melted out, how much snow was still up there to come into the reservoir uh, was a huge advantage for them in a really difficult management year. Here's another way to look at that. Um, the red horizontal line is how much water Hetch Hetchy Reservoir can hold. Uh, the green line is the actual uh, pool elevation or actual storage, how much water is in the reservoir. You can see that it topped out right perfectly at the end of the melt season. Uh, blue line is inflow, uh, a street snow melt flowing into the reservoir. And the blue vertical bars spaced along the bottom, that's the new data. That's how much water equivalent is in the entire basin as measured by the Airborne Snow Observatory on those dates. And you can see it melting out and the inflow um, uh, dropping down as well. Uh, snow pillows melted out in um, late May. So there were still several weeks of sig substantial snow melt left um, that they were otherwise blind to without our new data. So, these, uh, I think the third bullet there is the key thing. These spatially distributed data provide a new resilience to changing snow conditions in operational water management. We, we're getting more years that are less similar to the past. Uh, due to climate change factors, due to uh, regional disturbance factors that produce uh, things like dust on snow. And our, the index-based methods that we rely on operationally now are becoming uh, less able to adapt, uh, or are not able to adapt to these changing conditions. These new technologies, I think, provide that bridge, provide that, uh, that new capability. We plan to continue uh, the Airborne Snow Observatory demonstration missions uh, this year and next. Um, we, are, we just got a new LIDAR system that's gonna give us greater range and even higher resolution, um, so we can fly the same terrain faster uh, and hopefully expand uh, to new terrain as well, more, more basins. Uh, pretty much every water management operation in California is clamoring for this data at this point. Um, we, hope to, uh, we hope to do ex at least what we did last year um, and hopefully more flights uh, in Colorado next year as well. Currently, uh, so this map looks pretty similar to the one I showed you earlier, but this is the current snowpack conditions as of uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, Colorado's looking pretty good, right, around 100% of the median. Uh, again, these are indexes, and the median is the median of the past year. So there's some variation from this out there that we don't have a handle on. But uh, in general, it says we're looking pretty good along the spine of the Rockies and along the coast ranges, not so great. Um, I've seen uh, uh, variation in the amount of snow in, Cal in California's river basins of 12 to 40 percent of average right now. Uh, really, really grim. Uh, here's a picture of Echo Summit, California. That's uh, on January 3rd. That's the snow survey team uh, walking around with their snow tube looking for something to sample. Um, and. The graph on the bottom is the Lake Mead elevation, and you can see that the big black line that runs across there um, uh, is a, uh, the, the reservoir pool elevation at which shortage restrictions are triggered. So if, if the lake level drops to or below that, all kinds of legal cascade starts to happen. Um, and we're flirting with that right now. So, it's nice that we have a full snowpack at this point in the season. We'll see what the spring brings uh, in terms of either continued snowfall or, or who knows, maybe we'll get a bunch of dust again. Okay, some more teaser stuff. We got a bunch of st other projects going on using lasers to measure snow um, at more local scales. Uh, so I'll show you some snow pit uh, scanning we've done, some automation work. 
uh, to do repeat scans, um, and then a project to map uh, some avalanche uh, hazards. Uh, we were running around doing a different project. We said, hey, let's scan a snow pit, um, because why not, right? It's lasers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you can see some uh, you can see some layers in that that pit wall there, including a couple of really heavy dust layers uh, right up near the top of the snow pit. Um, and there's quite a quite a few other layers in there that don't really pop out to the eye, but they sure pop out to the laser. Uh, so, <laughs> so the colors are reflectance, which isn't that big of a deal, except that where you see black or dark blues that's really low reflectance. And so the bigger the snow grain size, uh, the more laser energy it's gonna absorb, and therefore the less reflectance we get. And so what we see there is a bunch of bands that are melt layers. Those are ice, la ice layers uh, that were created by snow melt that percolated down and then, uh, and then refroze. We can also see some, uh, some flow fingers, and this, these vertical bodies up here in the top are melt generated at the surface and percolating down through the snowpack and refreezing. Also, this sort of black speckled area down at the bottom, that's not actually the ground. That's the depth hoar layer, the, the big faceted crystals that we usually get at the bottom of the snowpack. It, and um, that year they were ex exceptionally large in this location. And they're so big, they're, they're absorbing most of the laser energy, but we are getting some speckle down there. But it's really remarkable how sharp that transition is. Um, so, you know, here in three minutes, we've got a full stratigraphy. So, well, Part of the ongoing, ongoing work is to correlate these results with other coincident measurements we made, normal manual measurements where you poke at the snow with your fingers, um, but also some radar and, and spectrometer measurements that were made coincidentally. So that's pretty cool and ongoing. Uh, colleagues at the Army Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab have developed an automated LIDAR system, again ground-based. This one's installed at the uh, snow study site at Mammoth Mountain in California. Uh, they built this cool enclosure and, and an automation system um, to do repeat 3D measurements of a local snowpack area um, ongoing. It's still out there collecting data right now. I'm not even sure if they're looking at it. Um, so this is about, oh, I don't know, 50 meters across. Um, and what we can do with that is look at the snow accumulating and then melting out through the season. Uh, this thing scans once every 15 minutes. Uh, this is a s substantially reduced data set from the full data set. Um, you see some shadowing there. Those are just areas that are, uh, that are hidden from the laser. Is that playing again? Let's watch that again. Uh, so we can see the snow kind of jumping up as it accumulates uh, and then melting out in uh, a, a smoother fashion. And we can look at that in a different way. And we can actually, more than just a time-lapse picture, we're getting time-lapse 3D information. So we can actually make measurements of it. You can see the, the sun cups form, disappear again when there's a fresh snowfall and reform. Um, and then we melt out. Those squares are actually, they're lysimeters. They collect the, the melt water as it flows out. So we can plot snow volume uh, in blue versus uh, the snow melt in red and extract quantitative data about the volume of snow there. So this is very local over a study site and can be used to calibrate instruments, et cetera. And basically the same idea as what we're doing from an aircraft uh, uh, for the whole River Basin. Another project that's ongoing, I'm working with uh, the Ski Patrol at Arapahoe Basin to map snow depth and snow depth change in starting zone, avalanche starting zones in their control area. Um, so we've got our ground-based laser system, and we did a snow free scan last summer, uh, and then we've been out uh, almost weekly uh, doing scans uh, throughout this, this winter. Um, and the idea there is to try to provide high resolution spatial snow depth and depth change information to them for uh, evaluation of their avalanche control program. They can, they can explore whether they put the, the explosive round in the right place. Uh, 
They can explore how much snow is left up there after it avalanched, um, et cetera. We hope to, to push this to a more real-time thing and actually provide them data uh, in a timely fashion prior to avalanche control uh, at some point in the future. Um, here's a little fly-through movie showing, uh, this is snow depth change um, day after Christmas to mid-January. Uh, scale goes from uh, plus two meters in red to minus two meters in blue. There's an avalanche that was a result uh, of control efforts. You can see there's a pretty interesting snow depth pattern around that or change in depth. If we zoom in on the crown, we can actually get quantitative measurements of the avalanche dimensions. Each of those points is a laser shot. So we've basically carpeted the entire hill uh, with laser shots. If we zoom in elsewhere, we can see bomb craters all over the place. Um, this avalanche, there's a, there's a bomb crater here. This avalanche broke from it and then remote triggered the avalanche we were just looking at. Um, so exploring uh, how connected uh, the slab is across that terrain is, an, is another interesting concept. Here we've got a bunch of bomb holes and you can see this one here is in a really deep spot and these are in shallower spots. Uh, so we can go back and evaluate why uh, something slid or why it didn't. You can see that black line running up the middle there. Um, that's actually a, a, a closure rope, and we're actually getting shots, laser shots hitting that rope. Uh, and I kid the ski patrol that I can zoom in and tell them whether they got their rope tight enough or not. Um, but it's, it's really pretty crazy, uh, <laughs> pretty crazy data, and we're, uh, the ski patrol is pretty psyched to, to be working with it and, and trying to explore how, uh, how we can use this going forward. So that's all I have. Thanks. I can't see, so you're just gonna have to shout out. Did you find anything uh, different in the uncompagrated space, and then you did it at Cachy or anything unique there? That was uh, in the uncompagrated, we weren't as tightly integrated with the water management, um, so we didn't have that sort of end-to-end. Uh, closure, if you will, to, to really put a value on the data. Um, uh, 2013 in the San Juans was the dustiest year we've measured to date, even worse than 2009, which was pretty bad. Um, uh, so, in fact, we were going to fly again in June, but the snow is all gone. Um, so there's, um, we're still working through, so we've got the 24-hour turnaround products. Uh, and then we, we push out a refined science product later on that is, that is even more accurate. Uh, we're still working through that to uh, evaluate the, 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 the actual impact of the dust in that year across the entire basin. Um, so that's probably the major difference between the two sites uh, was, the, was the dust load in Colorado. And I can follow up, does it help you track where the dust comes from at all? Um, it might if we flew at the right time and in the right locations, but just looking at the river basin as the dust is already on the ground? Not really, no, we have to, we can use uh, uh, satellite data and, and weather models uh, for that type of information. Um, how are you coordinating with Canada? Uh, <laughs> uh, we're not yet, although we've just recently had some inquiries from some Canadian folks asking if we'd come fly up there, North so. Dakota. Uh, nowhere in North Dakota yet. Hopefully, uh, we'd love to expand this to be, you know, west wide or even greater. So, uh, it'll take more than one plane and one laser, though. So. Do you think the data is free for these people, or don't you subscribe to it? It's free. Uh, this is it's a NASA mission, so it's free to the public. Um, we haven't released it yet because we want to ensure uh, the data quality before we pump it out. But we're not hiding it from anyone. So. What was the uh, parameters or the basis of the location of the snowfields? Like, um, they're actually cited for index purposes, and so they are. They often, um, and by that I mean they're they're well correlated with stream flow during the observational period when they set them up. Um, they're usually not very good representation of snow in the surrounding terrain, um, and we try to. So some other work that we have going on, we try to to uh, model the snowpack as it accumulates and, and flows out uh, in the computer system, and then we can, we can tweak that 
and say, okay, what happens if we cut all the forest down, for example, or what happens if we put a bunch of dust in there? Um, those type of models, they need weather information, they need snowpack information, and a lot of um, what we're dependent on is snow tail data for that, but it's not really intended to be used for that purpose, and so we find in some basins there's a big bias if you use it in that quantitative sense rather than an index sense. Um, so really they're cited for index purposes, not for quantitative uh, snow mapping and, and modeling purposes. But if it's all relative, which is what the things you're doing is relative to past history, then what's happening currently on snow tail sites is all relative to what's been there in the past. Well, we're assuming that it, the relationship is still current, is still valid in the current year. Uh, and in many years it is, but we're finding that more and more we're getting years that are anomalous for one reason or another, either a different pattern of snow accumulation or a different, uh, different amount of sunlight being absorbed. And does your reflectivity for dew in your ASO, is that uh, affected by surface conditions like dust or anything like that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's why we're doing it, is because dust, uh, among other factors, uh, has a strong influence on, on the snow reflectivity. So. But in terms of you getting a reading, it doesn't affect. Oh no, that your, that sensor is passive. Is it doesn't matter what's on the top. The laser doesn't really give much energy to the snowpack at all. Yeah. So. Yeah. And do you envision a time when the whole of the West Mountains will be flown over and mapped like this? Uh, I think to do really large areas like that, we'll need to go to a satellite-based platform, um, and that's that's definitely within the realm of possibility. Until then, we'll start expanding airborne operations as as we can. Yeah, um, so flying an aircraft around is definitely expensive. Um, and it costs a lot more than running a snow tail site, um, which you know, requires maintenance, but pretty much takes care of itself <laughs> otherwise. Um, the real value comes in the resilience, the ability to adapt to changes. So if Hetch Hetchy, for example, last year did not have the data that we provided, they would either have spilled a bunch of water and had to, had to uh, spend millions of dollars buying power on the open market or they would have been facing water shortages later in the season and been forced with uh, getting water from other sources and potential expense treating that water, et cetera. Um, so I think that's, that's the connection is really we have to see, we have to turn the problem around and say, okay, well, what, what are the costs to society, both uh, economically and otherwise, if we don't have this information? And uh, you know, we have a pretty good example of that in Hetch Hetchy this year, and we have you know, ongoing efforts to try to quantify that in other basins. So I think it'll sell itself. Trevor? Yeah, that was fabulous, Jeff. Uh, I'm just wondering, can you scale this down? You can maybe put a laser in my iPhone and I can have a little handheld app to read that snow tail? <laughs> we joked about having a real-time system mounted on your backpack or your GoPro or something so that with your Google Glass you can like <laughs> see the snowpack depth in front of you and be like, oh, there's a rock. And, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Why not? I just gave away my idea. If somebody makes a million dollars off that. <laughs> um, is there, is one of like the plants of this can look at kind of change in snowpack over time, have a, a climate change focus? Or is that not really? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a primary goal, but it's certainly something that's enabled by this. So, um, you know, I mentioned that our index sites may read the same thing, but we have completely different snow distributions. Well, one question is why? And so if we know both what the index site says and what the snow distribution is, we can start looking upstream of that and say, okay, well, what was the sequence of weather systems that delivered this? Um, and at some point in the future, when we have not only the long uh, time series of in situ data from the snow pillows, but also a time series of the airborne data, we can start to say, okay, well, what portion of this basin do we really need to map and how often? Do we need to wall, you know, wall to wall carpet it with one meter snow depth resolution every week? Or is this something that we can do? Yeah, that resolution is needed, but it, it's every other week. Or maybe we can coarsen uh, what, the, what the ground resolution is. So right now we don't know. We have some ideas, but 
those type of that longer term data sets will will let us address those. The, Yeah, when you look. Yeah, that's just it. Like, so contributing to snowpack next year, that's more of a hemispheric scale phenomenon where it's, you know, ocean and atmospheric mm -hmm. circulation patterns that are driving that. There is some um, uh, correlation between uh, snow melt, uh, uh, melt off dates and the onset of the summer monsoon here in Colorado. Uh, it's not super well established, but there does seem to be a relationship there, and that's undoubtedly due to uh, moisture fluxes from the land surface and, and trees into the atmosphere. Um, when you consider the whole hydrologic system, so not just snowmelt, but soil moisture, transpiration through trees, runoff, et cetera, um, there's undoubtedly memory in, in the system. Um, and you know, this year we had a really wet fall um, statewide. Uh, in fact, really, really wet in Boulder. <laughs> some of you may <laughs> remember some of that. Um, a drought-busting flood. Um, so, you know, right now, soil moisture is pretty, pretty high compared to especially the past couple of years. So if you have the same snowpack, but you have more soil moisture, you're going to get more runoff. Um, so that memory persists on, you know, a multiple-year time scale, whereas the snowpack is just a single-year phenomenon. So. Yeah, when we're talking about the full hydrologic system, we have to we have to consider that as well. Back. When you're looking at so like a different average density map, are you looking at that vertically, like each layer in the snowpack, or are you looking at that just like if it's two years of just like this density, or just total average of the numbers? Yeah, great question. So when we dig a snow pit and measure snow density every ten centimeters, that we get this this profile, this stratigraphy profile of density. If we average all of those values and get a bulk density for the entire snowpack, that's what we're doing okay. here. So, so one pit in the basin and then a separate one top? We, we have some field measurements from our team uh, using the, the snow tubes, um, like the snow survey guys use. We have the snow survey data, and we also have the snow pillow data, which is, gives you water equivalent. There's also a, uh, a sonar unit there that tells you the snow depth, and so you can get density out of that. Um, it's still only a couple of points in the basin, but density doesn't vary nearly as much as depth does. So, yeah, it's a bulk density, not a stratigraphy. Even with altitude? Oh, it varies. It definitely varies with altitude. Uh, varies with forest cover. Um, it varies with snow depth, actually. So the depth variability also contributes to the density variability. But overall, it's much, much more consistent uh, than depth is. All right. So uh, I'm sure Jeff would. I uh, wouldn't mind staying here for another couple minutes and answering anybody else's questions, but uh, for now, uh, I'd like to break and give a round of applause to Jeff and his work here. <laughs> and if you guys are all around, next week we have a study of the response of the alpine tree line to climate change with a detailed analysis from Pikes Peak by Dr. Miroslav Kamal. Hope to see you there. Good luck.